Are you looking to start a podcast? Then see this episode's show notes for our unique promo code to get up to two months of free podcasting service with Libsyn when you sign up for a new account. Get your show on Apple and Spotify. Get helpful audience building stats and all the support you need to sound your best. They can even do video. Bring your podcast to life and have your voice heard here, there, and everywhere with Libsyn. Again, see our show notes for our unique Libsyn promo code and get podcasting. You're listening to Creep Geeks Podcast. So it begins again. Welcome back to the Creep Geeks Podcast, Season 7, Episode 296er. Weird Moon, Weird Earthquake and Hum, and Haunted Object Disposal. Yeah. Got some weird stuff to talk about in this particular episode of the Creep Geeks Podcast. Figure we go ahead and kind of do it. Yep. And these are some things that uh, have affected us directly. We've seen the Weird Moon. Yeah. And the Weird Earthquake and Hum is relatively close to us and something we've talked about in the past. Yeah. And haunted objects as well. Um, we have talked about haunted object disposal in the past, but it's good to have a refresher because it is the holiday gift giving season and you never know when somebody's going to find a thrift store treasure and give it to you. <laughs> and later on, all sorts of weird stuff happens. Yeah. So why not keep this in your back pocket for things that you can do to protect yourself should, uh, uh, should the need arise. We're all about giving here at Creep Geeks Podcast. We're going to be giving you some information. <laughs> So, well, that was a fake laugh. Do that again. No. <laughs> it was ah. not. All right. <laughs> I'm just poking. Come on. We had a delicious McDonald's uh, dinner because sometimes we talk about what we have for dinner. A lot of times it's the goal to do the podcast and get done. Yeah. A delicious dinner. Not that it's a trial to do the podcast. It's that, you know, it helps to be enthusiastically centered towards a meal oriented at success well that and it is a holiday so we're quite busy and we needed to make sure we got a podcast into all y'all which meant having fast food for dinner gotta tell you uh uh, and this is with all due respect to people that like mcdonald's it's garbage man i'm tired of it i don't know what's going on they need to do better and we have for as much as they charge you can go to a regular restaurant and eat like a sit-down type place and we have such a limited selection because we do live way out here in Western North Carolina. Yeah, so. I don't think people care about how far we live anymore. They're like, whatever, man, we go somewhere different. We don't have a lot of choices food. are scant. Yeah, so not a lot. So of I don't know. Maybe it's just I don't know, maybe I'm getting older to the point where it's just like you know, the stuff that you have at home is better. Yes, it is. Like it really is. You know, like when people put on Facebook and stuff where they say we, we got McDonald's at home and it's like a, <laughs> a, a you know a little hockey puck looking hamburger with. With regular bread soaked all the way through, yeah, that tastes better. It does. So, and which is sad. You know, I even had a McRib the other day and was, uh, yeah, yeah, not as enthused. Yeah. Other countries get amazing McDonald's stuff. They got all this like new menu items and junk. And I'm like, man, and here they got crappy adult kids meals. Well, there are many people who are excited about those. So okay, and there are just as many who are like, I paid an extra two dollars for what? A toy. It's not even a toy you can play with. It's like, here, set this up on the thing and look at it. It doesn't move. There's no uh, movable, appendable appendages or anything like that. It just sits there. Well, that's like my, one of my coworkers was mentioning how. Back in my day, we had stuff that you could swallow. Last year's. Choke it up a little bit. Uh, adult Happy Meal toys are now on eBay for crazy prices. So, Well, I got one in the van floating around somewhere still in the plastic bag. Yeah. So, anyways. All right. So, um, here's the deal. You can get a hold of us and and basically communicate with us in many different ways. We have a a uh, phone number that you can call. This is where you jump in with the phone number. That phone number is going to be 575-208-4025. 867-5309. That's not true. <laughs> no, but it's still a pretty popular phone number. Uh, we do have a Facebook page you can kind of check out and go there. We're on every anywhere you can hear a podcast, you can hear us. And basically, we have social media stuff everywhere, including TikTok and threads, which we don't interact with, or I don't because threads is a lie. I got to remember to log in frequently. I don't, you know, I hate to say it. I don't even remotely care about threads, not a bit. I feel like we've been duped into it. Mm-hmm. And now, in order to get rid of it, you have to like delete your entire profile. It's just, it's, 
It's garbage. Anyways, I do want to thank our new Facebook group members who have recently joined. We've had a bunch of them join in, so thank you guys for joining. Hmm. And tell your friends to join. <laughs> I did not know that. I can't even log into half my stuff hardly. Okay. I have to check that. Yeah. You're supposed to be like savvy on these things i am i don't check it every single day okay so facebook is one of the things that i don't check every single day anymore i used to check it like every and i i have to remind myself to check it you know what you're making that face it's true i have things to do (laughs) i'm just saying what i'm I'm enjoying the youtube shorts and and tiktok more than ever well then um it seems like my my influence and the choice selection I have has finally gotten to the point where it's just cultivating and showing me stuff that I want to see. Okay. Or at least it is now. Now that everything is listening, they'll, they'll change that. You know, the algorithm, otherwise known as AI. Hmm. So here's the deal. We've been to Roswell a couple of different times, and we've been to the Roswell Museum there, the International Museum, yeah. UFO. I can never remember the name of it, <laughs> which is bad, too. have been there four times. Oh, it's like gosh. the it's the international Roswell International. What is that called? It's oh, it's gonna bug me now. I went are right you, out of my head. Are you? I'm passing inter- out from the McDonald's we had. I can't even hardly breathe. It is the International UFO Museum and Research Center. That's what it is. And library. Oh, A lot yeah. Of people the, forget library. that part. Well, yeah, they had to throw it on there. I guess that means tax tax. Uh, yeah. Whatever. But uh, anyway, uh, so. They have a milestone. It's pretty significant. They welcomed their five millionth visitor. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So this dude named Chris McDonald stepped into the site with his daughter, Hannah. And while a pair undoubtedly did not expect to be presented with balloons and an array of souvenirs to, co- to commemorate <laughs> the milestone, it turned out uh, that the father and daughter had a surprise of their own for the staff by virtue of uh, being residents of the city. That's cool. Though. Yeah, because yeah. it says, uh, very rarely do we see a visitor from Roswell come into the museum. Yeah. And I know what they meant by this. You know, because when you live in a city, I mean, you're probably just a little tired of it, I guess, even though, honestly, there's not a whole lot to make people want to go to Roswell other than this. Yeah. You know, having been there and not to slide Roswell at all. But uh, and he, McDonald explained that it came in and it, after basically Hannah had expressed an interest in space travel. Oh. So in addition to balloon souvenirs and notoriety by way of the milestone, the family also received a lifetime pass to the attraction, which has become something of a centerpiece in the city uh, since it opened in 1992. Wow. According to the museum, they welcome a whopping 220,000 people each year and contribute a staggering $60 million in annual financial impact to the community and surrounding areas. Yeah, that's pretty serious business. So the people in Roswell that live in Roswell, yeah. they really need to embrace that. Because i got to tell you, man, if, you're, if it wasn't there, what's the reason to stop? You'd stop on your way to go to uh, Carlsbad Caverns. Pretty much. Yeah, if you come in from that way. But. Yeah. Anyway, I thought that was pretty cool. And since we've been there multiple times, I thought we'd share. Yeah. And um, the souvenirs, um, that is some of the best part of there. Uh, when we visited... Um, it's dog, it was dog friendly. Yeah. And when we came, they gave our dogs souvenirs. Yep. Little alien, yeah. little alien stuff. We still have one. As a matter of fact, I just did something with it. <laughs> Found it. I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I think the first time I went was in 1994. Mm. No. Three, four. <laughs> I think it was in 94. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Kind of weird. Kind of cool. Uh, so anyway, there you go. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go out to Roswell and go to the museum and and you're wondering if it's worth the trip to go, yeah, you should go. And definitely drive into town slowly, not just because of posted speed limits, but because as you drive in, there's little roadside things that you can look at. Yeah, and there's also, you know, signs have saucers and aliens and, and the McDonald's looks like a UFO and all sorts of stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's fun. Uh, the street lights are little alien heads. Uh, get some pretty good beef jerky. You can get a tattoo if you want. There's all sorts of things you can do there. And the bakery next door has like little UFO shaped conchitas. Yeah. And, like, well, they did. Who, who knows what's going on now? It's been a minute since we've been there. I, I would think that it stayed. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. We, we bought some uh, jerky off a guy named Scooby who was riding around on his Harley. <laughs> Yelled at us. <laughs> hey! 
you want some jerky? <laughs> just like, yeah. It's kind of a random interaction. It was still the best jerky I've ever yeah, had. Yeah, it's pretty good, cowboy style. Yeah. All right, so uh, evidently the Milky Way makes a sound, and you can listen to the center of the Milky Way translated into sound, and this is from Smithsonian Magazine, and the reason why I put this in here is because we mentioned Smithsonian Magazine in our last podcast. Okay. Let's be honest, a lot of sources of information that you get uh, when it comes to UFO, cryptid, paranormal, ghost, and that sort of thing don't necessarily come from someone that could be considered to be reputable. Yeah. uh, Or as reputable as the Smithsonian Magazine. Hmm. You know, because you got National Geographic, and then if you want to, you know, stick your finger up, a little pinky in the air when you're looking at the magazine, you can step up into Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah, because the subscription price for Smithsonian was a lot. I remember going, wow, that's crazy. Uh, the digital So one has, one has more articles and words, and one has more pictures. Yeah. National Geographic's got more pictures than the Smithsonian does. <laughs> at least that's how I look at it. So. I don't know. Um, no, it's true. So... I'm going to play this sound. Yeah. And, you know, we, we may or may not have to worry about copyright. I don't know. But we're going to give it a shot and see what happens. The universe is going to hit us for copyright. <laughs> well, they, they tried to hit us for copyright for the last song we played that we actually have the rights to. Uh, yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. And it was somebody else who didn't even have the rights to that song either. Hmm. Who tried to say that we didn't have the rights to it, even though they did the same thing we did. You know, you, you join one of these music sites so that you can play music and have a license to it. And so did they. So it's how are like how are you claiming copyright? You didn't even it's not your song to make. You got the same license we did, so I just I laughed. And then I hit, you know, dispute. Okay. I disputed it. All right. All right, so anyway, uh, get ready to have your socks knocked off. This is what the data sonification, the galactic center of the multi wave length center of the universe sounds like. You ready? Mm-hmm. All right, hold on. Let me make sure I got the volume ready because I usually screw this up. I'm going to crank it loud and proud. You feeling it, right? It's nice. That's not what it sounds like. (laughs) Okay, first off, hold on. Let it finish. Be respectful. That's nice, right? That was good stuff. <sighs> All right, so what this is, or what it, since 2020, there's been a team that's been translating a number of astronomical images into sounds, and they call them, basically that's called sonification, right? So they interpret what they think it sounds like, what the data sounds like, and then they basically create this little like clips that we just listened to or songs, and each one from the pillars of creation to the Carinia Nebula, Tells a scientific story that a person can follow just by listening. Right? Okay. So the translation process involves computers that use algorithms to map the telescope data as noises. And evidently this one came, uh, This they call this one image, right? Depicts the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. It's a combination of data from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer Space Telescope, uh, Chandra and basically the sonification takes a listener from left to right of the image and the higher pitch sounds representing light in the top region and lower pitch sounds are representing the bottom and the brightness of the light determines the volume of the sound and each telescope's data is played by a different set of instruments. So I would rather just hear it kind of like how, how the noise just a radioactive sort of radio noise blasting from space. Yeah. Like, yeah. Me too. Cause we'd played that, a while back on the podcast, wasn't it like the black hole that they recorded or something? Yeah. Yeah. I I like hearing those. Yeah, to me, it sounded kind of like if, if you yeah. could basically he- hear space, that's kind of what it would sound like to me. This is, you know, sort of a... Artsy. Yeah. Which is okay, but at the same time, it, the reason why I put this in here is like, 
Uh, there's a group of people out there in the world that think that like, like Bigfoot and all these critters and cryptids and stuff like that are just super friendly and they're all love and light. Yeah. And me, I'm like, they're going to rip you apart. They're going to eat you. They're animals. They're, they're way more mean than you would think or may, way more probably uh, animalistic than what we'd like mm-hmm. to, you know, they're not Harry, Harry and the Hendersons, I think did Bigfoot. And that's kind of what I think with this. I think space is, 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 is well, way more rough. And see that's, these little twinkly things that, that we've been listening to. Yeah, because that's what it, it's explained in here how um, the brightness of the light determines the volume of the sound. So light, brighter parts of the image play higher and sweeter, and then the darker components apparently play lower pitch sounds. Well, when you look at traditional images of space, there's a lot of darkness in there. Yes. So... Are they interpreting the right visual of space? I think it's I would reversed. think it would be much more darker sounding. Yeah. I mean, know? you got, there's a whole lot of uh, dark darker matter right there. Deeper sounding than yeah. this. I think and it's, it's missing a lot of high pitched screams, <laughs> right? And roars <laughs> from space, dying stars. <laughs> but know? in space, nobody can hear you scream. That's right. In space, no one can hear you scream. Yeah. I don't know. I, I do think this is a little too love and light for me. Well, that's why I played so. it for you, just to make you feel good. <laughs> so, oh, right. that's nice. So, speaking of Milky Way blob, because we already just talked about the Milky Way sound, there's a strange blob circling the Milky Way's central black hole and basically it's shooting powerful radiation at Earth every 76 minutes. Oh. Okay. See, this is space. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think if you go into space with a cavalier attitude that everything's going to be fine. We'll never hear from you again, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, every seven, and this is uh, according to life, or I'm sorry, life science, the spray is the strange blob that's circling the Milky Way central black hole. It's shooting this energy, radiation at us every 76 minutes. Yeah. Basically, shooting gamma radiation, like some gamma rays. Every 76 minutes, it does a pulse, right? Mm hmm. And so this basically is coming at us or maybe coming from a blob of matter. It's whipping around 30% the speed of light. It's pretty fast. So, um, is it targeted directly at earth? I don't know. It's coming at us. Huh? Space is pretty vast. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think it's, I, I don't know if it's like intentional or if it just happens to be the way it is, but, um, uh, you know how, like, when you see space shows and they're like, oh, my God, we have to go through an asteroid field. And it's like, you know, if, if you're worried about the asteroids are, like, you know, 10 million miles away from you. and I, you know, it, it, There's a whole lot more space in space than. But I'm one that falls for those headlines because, like, right in the middle of this, there's something terrifying here. Super massive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way is Approaching, approaching the cosmic speed limit. Yeah, dragging space time along with it. And I'm like, this is, this is the Doctor Strange you know, sequel. I don't want to see. <laughs> yeah, it's like I don't want to be dragged. Well, you know, you, with a, when you read these things, it's like in five billion years we'll all be gone. It's like, yeah. oh, and then you're like, oh, I'll be long. I'm good. I'm yeah. glad. I'll be long dead before I got to worry about that. But still, I fall for these headlines every single time. So here's what got me. So I, I put this in here, and because I thought it was pretty interesting. You know, every 76 minutes we're getting blasted with some gamma ray radiation, right? Yeah. The way it says, uh, the way the article reads, in new non-peer-reviewed research posted <laughs> to the preprint server, uh, X, Arzig, whatever. Anyway, there's a duo of astrophysicists from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And they conclude that the bursts of radiation are emanating from a blob of gas spinning around the black hole at almost one-third the speed of light. Huh. And the team's findings may solve a, uh, basically a mystery regarding the Milky Way in the central black hole of Milky Way, formerly known as Sagittarius A. Yeah. And it's located around uh, 26,700 light years from Earth. And it's basically perplexed uh, astronomers for two years. Hmm. Like, what is that? That's what they're trying to figure out. Yeah. So. Yeah, so. So, of course, when you see something like this, you pretty much uh, skim the article seeing if it's going to kill you or not. Yeah. Right? At least I do, because it's 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 a pretty uh, complicated subject. And they're saying that all black holes are bound by a region called an event horizon, which marks the point which nothing, not even light, has the velocity needed to escape the black hole's immense gravity. 
Yeah. Uh, so this means that black holes don't emit radiation themselves. So the gamma rays must be coming from within the environment of Sagittarius A. So it's this blob of gas yeah. that's actually emitting this stuff. Yeah, every 76 minutes. That's So what you know what my thought was? What? Whatever it is is out there dying. It's like, ah! And then 76 minutes, ah! That's, that's, <laughs> oh, that's so Isn't that terrible? Up. That is horrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, oh, no. And top of that, you know, from the distance we are at, we are identifying it as a blob, yeah. possibly a bo- blob of gas. It's probably an entire space community. Yeah, that's terrifying. It is. Ter- so is you it? could make it anything you want. Oh, or no. it could be like somebody just holding down a button going, hello? Oh. Because we're trapped in space. Don't say and in that. space, no one can hear you scream. Stop. But they can feel your gamma radiation or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> ah! Stop. That's that's awful. Because we don't know. At the end of the day, we really don't know. We think we do, and we think we're all smart and stuff, and there's going to be some alien race or whatever that's either here or already knows about it. It's like, what are you guys talking about? That's not how that works at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> You're like, oh, we need, to, uh, we need to do some bloodletting to cure you. Let's put leeches on you. And modern science is like, look, man, that really rarely doesn't work. Why are you doing that? See, and if aliens did ever land, like, you know. No, let's pack urine and mud into the wound. All right, why, why are you guys doing that? It reminds me of McCoy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because I was going to put an article about uh, being able to talk to whales. Yeah. And the first thing I thought of was a Star Trek, uh, uh, Star Trek movie where they're basically uh, yeah. the whales, right? And dude is lying on a hospital bed or lady's lying on a hospital bed because she's got kidney failure. Yeah. And so, you know, Bones gives her like a piece of chewing gum. And basically it was here. It's like, it can grow a new kidney, right? And he's like, basically calls them savages. Oh. You savages here. Yeah. It might be that way in the future. Be able to chew like a piece of gum or whatever and generate some new organs. Wouldn't that be great? But I don't think it's going to be that way. I think like we were saying earlier, how we, we have this community of people who believe cryptids, aliens, monsters, what have you, are all love and light. I... If aliens ever landed, I would not be surprised if they just walked up to like a team of our scientists or world leaders and just smacked them across the face with a space for dummies book or something, you know, or equivalent of. I think that you think that they would actually care enough to intervene. And, and like see, that. that's that's that that's the biggest burn of all is that they don't care enough to interact. Yeah. So, you know, at least if they didn't interact, it would make us feel like, oh, at least they're acknowledging that we do not know enough. No, we're we're you know? so ignorant as a race. We try to figure out a way to, you know, <laughs> like what? <laughs> Just give us a chance, you know, that kind of thing. It's like all right, whatever. So, yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, moving back into the podcast, and we're not necessarily worried about the gamma ray bursts that's coming every seventy six minutes. We really don't know what they are, and doesn't really appear to be any kind of great threat. I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> So uh, it was like about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago. You, you maybe probably not quite that long. I don't remember. You sent me a picture of the of the moon and being surrounded by like a frost halo around the moon. It was basically two weeks ago. Is that what it was? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you sure it wasn't six seven months ago? <laughs> no. <laughs> are you, Look, uh, oh my god! <laughs> I cannot believe you. Oh boy. <sighs> <laughs> Time just flies. <laughs> it does not fly. <laughs> okay, so as I've been corrected, it was uh, about a week ago. <laughs> Are you sure? It seemed like it was... Like, now you're going to try to scroll back through all the stuff that you send me. Like you're going to be able to find it in the duration of the podcast. You send me thousands of things. Um, It was... No, because I have this. <sighs> okay, from November 22nd till November 27th, we had a lunar halo appearing in the sky yes. uh, in various parts of Western North Carolina. Um, be- yeah, because I have one picture from the 23rd, and I have another from very, very late at night, the 26th. Yes. So barely two and a half weeks ago. Okay, seems uh, so, so long. Longer. Yeah, it, does. <laughs> it seems like it's a long time ago. Yeah. All right. And so anyway, um, according to this weather... I don't, I don't know what station this is. It's 12 WBOY, uh, West Virginia, I think, yeah. right? Um, if you looked up at the moon in the past 24 hours, you may have noticed this, a ring of light surrounding it. This ring is called a moon halo. 
And contrary to what you might think, it's fairly common. According to Space.com, the ring is an optical illusion caused by the refraction of, moon, uh, of the moonlight uh, from ice crystals in the atmos- upper atmosphere. And these little specks of light basically turn the atmosphere into a giant lens, uh, which causes these rings to appear um, around the moon or even around the sun. Yeah. <clears throat> And because the moon halo requires ice to form, they're usually fairly common in places that are cold year-round and appear most often in winter. That's why I was calling it a frost moon. Um, Yeah, and there's folklore surrounding over the years in which it mainly basically is a predictor of bad weather. And I was going to say that we were thinking that this winter is going to be pretty bad. It's already cold. Um, Or I should say it's already been colder than what we normally have in our particular region of Western North Carolina since I can remember in the past five years or so, and I don't like it. We've already broken one record for the year as far as coldest day, Um, and that was, gosh, I think it was like last week or something. I thought I heard about this like two months ago. No, it was was probably the end or middle of November we had broken a cold weather record. Uh, But going back to the folklore, Yes, it has been a predictor of, you know, bad or severe weather changes. Um, Like, you know, it's a warning sign of rain, sleet, or snow. Uh, The folklore goes, if the moon shows like a silver shield, you need not be afraid to reap your field. But if she rises haloed round, soon we'll tread on deluged ground. Um, That means soaked. Yes. Now, there's a few indigenous and native tribes that have their own beliefs regarding the moon halo or moon dog. Uh, it's supposed to be a sign of good luck or a message from the spirits. If you spot it in the sky in the winter time, whereas some other groups believe it to be a harp harbinger or change of, uh, balance and harmony in society. So there you go. It's either good or bad, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's kind of nice, I guess. And see, I'm used to it being called a moon dog. So, well, they have them like in New Mexico and stuff, but they look different than a frost moon. Yeah. So, so you know how you know it's a frost moon? No. Oh. It's cold. <laughs> so, I mean, really, yeah. It's like. And, the, and they're also, maybe it's because. They're in, sparkly. In New Mexico and Colorado, you're so much closer to the moon. You're several thousand feet higher in elevation. It just, it seemed smaller when we'd see them in New Mexico. It, yeah. Like tighter, because these ones, it was like really hard for me to get a decent picture because. Because it's just basically a... Uh, it was a huge halo, yeah. you know? Well, I don't know. So I have no opinion about that either way, except that, you know, when I've seen them and heard about them, it's been, wow, okay, so it's going to be probably a more yeah. uh, severe winter than but if you, we had before. Yeah, and if you have any folklore or, like, you know, granny tales or whatever that your family used to say about this type of weather, let us know. I'm interested in what you've heard. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. So speaking of the Chinese spacecraft that smashed into the moon. <laughs> okay. Remember, it basically left a skid mark on the moon, and we're like, oh, and, and then right after that, India landed a spacecraft. Yeah. Which kind of looked cheesy. I'm you know, like, something's wrong with this. But uh, evidently, they're trying to say that uh, it was carrying something mysterious. An undisclosed payload. Yeah. Oh, okay. So what it is, I don't know, but. It's mysterious. This is what <laughs> scientists say. Uh, well, okay. So. <sighs> and this was in 2022. Yeah. And it says a piece of Chinese space junk hit the moon and left a mysterious double pockmark on the surface. As it turned out, there was more to the story than meets the eye. Yeah. Um, so the specific lunar collision, to be fair, has been mired in speculation since before it happened. And space.com recounts in its own write-up that the debate or debacle began in 2015 when scientists noticed that some manner of space junk was on a collision course with the moon. And astronomers initially believed that it was the SpaceX Falcon 9 booster, but eventually scientists figured out that it was the launcher for the Chinese uh, Shenzhenar lunar mission, like the rover mission, which had been launched the year before. And so China denied it that the craft was part of a Chinese mission, but U.S. Space Command pushed back on that assertion, saying that the probe's spent upper stage never re-entered our atmosphere, which meant that it was out there floating somewhere nearish to our planet, or as it turns out, the moon. Yeah. So, you know, they're thinking there's a little subterfuge going on because it never came back. Usually it comes back, right? 
And so not only did the latest study with a high degree of confidence that the debris hit the moon in March 2022, it was uh, almost certainly from the Long March 3C rocket, but researchers also concluded that the strange double crater it left behind indicates that it was carrying something else. Yeah. So they don't know, right? So they're thinking they're saying that basically it wasn't just a spent rocket booster, that there was something else there too. Yeah. Some kind of had some weird payload. And so, you know, of course, that's just going to be a matter of guesswork until somebody goes up there and really takes a look. But specifically, the researchers' observations of the Chinese rockets suggested that there was something heavy attached to it, and that's what made it tumble in space before it crash landed. That makes sense. Yeah, because they don't normally crash like that. And it says something that's uh, been in space as long as this is subjected to the forces, you know, from Earth and the moon's gravity and also from the light from the sun. So you'd expect it to wobble a little bit, particularly when you consider the rocket body is a big empty shell and it has a heavy engine on one end of it. So, But this was just tumbling end over end in a very stable way. Yeah, and whatever it was, it seems to have been big enough to counterbalance the 1,200-pound, the two 1,200-pound engines. Um, so why why can't we figure it out, though? Is it because Well, because it's spy stuff. Mm. It's straight-up spy stuff. Okay, so if the rockets weigh 1,200 pounds each, let's just say, right? Yeah. 2,400 pounds. So you have like a car's worth of stuff in the other end of this tube, which shouldn't have anything in that end of the tube. So what is it? I mean, 2,400 pounds in space. I mean, that could be a section of a moon base that China has been building. It seems a little light. It, it, it's not going to be the whole thing. I mean, yeah, it seems a little light, but at the same time, think about if you could take like a Volkswagen, 1967 Volkswagen Microbus Deluxe with no engine, no wheels, uh-huh. just a shell because it's a tube and it's round shape. And make it, that's a, that's almost a habitable section to live in. It could be a space, like a, a bed area. You could put bunks in there. I mean, it, it could be a lot. Hmm. 20 feet long, six feet tall, roughly. You could also. Five put, or six feet wide. There's a lot of stuff you could do with that. Or you could just drop an entire data collection <laughs> capsule on one side of the moon. Yeah, or I maybe it's part of a moon. Uh, moon I think it's part of maybe a lunar colony or a moon base or something crazy like that. Or it could have been part of maybe an observation platform that's supposed to be put into space or it could be uh maybe satellite killers. Satellites are inside it and then it was supposed to deploy itself and it didn't. So China said go to the moon and crash the moon cuz we don't want you crashing over here and uh, anywhere where the US could get it. I I'd like to think it's like some sort of giant like RFID tag or something, and it's just no. like <laughs> guaranteed whatever it is. Since they're not, since China is not saying what it is, shares and receives info. So basically, it's 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 nefarious. I mean, if you think about okay, so Russia has stepped away from the space program and the International Space Station. China, it's not going to be a part of that. They're going to side with Russia. They're going to work together. It's a thing. It was something that was supposed to do something, and it didn't work out. There's probably a problem, and instead of basically having it crash back to Earth like it should, which everything else does, it just went to the moon instead and smacked into the moon. I mean, they were blaming it on, <laughs> they were blaming it on SpaceX and Elon Musk. Oh yeah, it's just a Falcon Nine booster. That's what that is. That they're polluting space. It's like no, it's the Chinese because they just hating on Elon and everybody associated with that because he's you know he's getting all the attention. See, I, I don't with, know. with this space reason, program, I, I I'm hung up on what if it's an unmanned method of collecting data, whether it's satellite data or you ain't got to worry about action. that. They got balloons for that, you know. But this is stationary and far enough away that it's it would be a pain in the butt to dismantle or do anything against it. I think it was supposed to pop out of the back of the tube and do its own thing, and it got stuck or broke or whatever, and they're like, what are we going to do with this? Let's just send it away. We don't want it to come back. I think it's spy junk. Mm. Yeah. So. I mean, if they want to listen to us, they don't have to. They already have things in place for that. This is something different. Mm. So, you know, destroying spe- destroying satellites is a new hotness. Yeah. So, I mean, hey, that's part of the reason why we created Space Force. People just think it was something to do. No, and there's a reason for it. Yeah. So, anyway, did I tell you about that conversation I had with somebody who used to be in the Air Force? No. Who basically told me about the satellite killers and everything else that's going on? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And is, is 
as jokey as that guy was, he got dead serious when he started talking about that. And I said, what did you used to do? And he told me, basically, he used to track satellites. That was his job in the Air Force. So, so there you go. That's it about that. So Chinese space crash, it smashed the moon, was carrying something mysterious. Speaking of mysterious, there's been recent earthquakes in our area. Yeah. And this has been relatively uh, an ongoing thing. Ever and since 2020, yep. we've had been, vibrations and earthquakes and weirdness going on. An increase in them in this particular region. Uh, Western North Carolina, all the way through to South Carolina, all the way through to Tennessee. Yep. Georgia's next. You and watch. it's very specific that these earthquakes are measurable. We are on the East Coast. We are along the Blue Ridge Mountains and Smoky, uh, Smoky Mountains. Yeah. So this is an older continental area or what have you. Uh, to have active seismic activity is kind of alarming. In, in my opinion. Yeah. And we have a chat. We actually have a link to it. So if you want to check out the department of national resources, South Carolina.gov and the geology section where it has recent earthquakes. But let me just read off. Oh, there's a bunch. Well, okay. So December 13th today, we had a 1.6 earthquake. Um, and then November 30th, November 29th, November 29th, uh, November 27th, one, two, and two on November 26th. Yeah. That's crazy. And there's more than that because yeah. the reason why I threw this in the podcast is because, you know, whenever they talk about weird stuff like rumbles and earthquakes and stuff like that, what does everybody jump to? Us included. Underground. Deep underground tunnels, man. Because <laughs> yeah. they already said, and they, they basically came out a couple years ago, where they started reactivating some of these underground dwellings, these deep underground military bases that were basically um, mothballed. Yeah. So they're bringing them back, and they're in the process of rejuvenating them and things like that. Right? So what's to say that they don't need uh, some new tunnels to maybe connect some some new ones? Because a lot of these started, and also uh, around the same time that they started, and we became aware of them, was also around the same time that the alleged uh, deep underground military base in Linville Gorge was expanding and yeah. people started noticing. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I So I don't think that these are just random earthquakes. I think that when you're drilling and you're using, you know, some kind of drilling machine or expanding deep underground military base and stuff, just because the noise that you create in one spot doesn't mean that that's where it's going to be picked up and it's going to be picked up somewhere else because the way sound travels. So it would be entirely possible that a lot of the stuff that we're seeing here related to this stuff is due to underground construction or building or drilling or something. It, my thing is though, like, is an ex, is it an expansion of mining? And that was actually covered in an article that we ended up not using because it was just way too brief um, that happened in our local regional news. And people were asking, hey, what's with all this earth shaking? What's with these small earthquakes? And a reporter in Asheville basically did the footwork, uh, called different mining companies that were registered in the state of North Carolina and asked, do you have any active permits for these regions? And after calling, I want to say, 16 different companies, basically he only got one yes and 15 no's. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't mining. Well. Or mining expansion that we could, It wasn't reported mining yeah. or mining expansion. If the government walks up and says, we need you to mine this and you can't say anything to anybody, what are you going to say? Or prospecting. So prospecting also would be covered by that. So if the government wants prospecting, they really don't have to file permits with themselves most of the time. No, and they do things like saying, okay, you know, and basically for national security, you can't yeah. talk about this with anybody. And if you do, we're going to do it. And unless it vi yeah. violates or may cause some sort of EPA concern, they don't care about that. They do sometimes. So I, it, it's amazing that you think the government gives a crap about that sort of thing well, when they're doing a black, pro in, a black project. In Mexico, we had all that big old EPA fighting because somebody was, an outside interest was prospecting near an area that may have had a uranium. Yeah, but if this is a project sanctioned by the government, the EPA and rules. it was sanctioned. Okay, but I think that they don't give a crap about that sort of thing unless it gets caught. I don't think that somebody goes, well, hey, guys, we can't build this underground base because of EPA, EPA concerns. Oh, sorry. 
they don't, that's not how they work at all. <laughs> with the areas that are in question, though, because some of these do fall within sovereign territories, like the Koala Boundary, I would think. Uh, but see, that's the thing, though. Does the Koala Boundary, how far underground does that extend? I don't know. It doesn't. It extends upwards. Hmm. And I think once you get past a certain depth, mining or mineral rights and that sort of thing go away. I mean, you can, can, you have a certain, <laughs> there's a respect to your sovereignty as far as airspace above, but I don't, below, when does that end? And plus, if they have to dig down deep enough, say they have to go down 500 feet to make sure it's stable enough for them to put a tunnel through there. Mm-hmm. Using a nuclear boring machine, it basically turns the tunnel into like almost glass as it burns its way through, because that's what they use. Mm-hmm. They got to go down deep enough to make sure it's going to be stable enough to support it. Mm-hmm. So I think your sovereign rights, don't go down forever. They don't go to this core of the world uh, of the earth. I think you, know, you get past a certain footage. It's probably where below water, where good drinkable water is. Once you get underneath that, nobody cares. Uh, I mean, um, cause that was an issue with out in the Gulf of Mexico where you had drilling companies sitting right off our, our international bo- or water line, right? Our 12 miles out for international border. Yeah. Drilling or going down to the floor of the ocean and then drilling sideways into our oil reserves or into our area that would be ours and getting the oil. And there's, uh, that, there's a little company called, a uh, little country called China. Mm-hmm. They still do it. They're like, oh, well, you know, we, we're not, we're not in your water. We're not in your territorial waters, but we can drop down and go underneath the, the dirt and scoot sideways and get it all. Wow. So I was trying to find the closest one of these within the past year. And it was just north northwest of Marion, almost near Mount Mitchell. Yeah. And so the ongoing thing has been that there's been a deep underground military base or multiple deep underground military bases and military expansion in this area underground. Wow. And we've talked to people that have seen some things and said, Yeah, yeah, you know, and it seems to be a thing and it hasn't stopped. As a matter of fact, it seems like it's actually sort of picked up. Now, I will say there seems to be a concentration of these between Lake Junaluska and Canton. So, that's... Yeah, well... Yeah. That's neither here nor there. Well, yeah. I guess Lake Junaluska, if you really get into stuff, apparently has some weird stuff happening around it. So, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. They tried to blame it all... uh, uh, I shouldn't say blame it. They tried to say an explanation was for one place is that they were filling the dam with water and it was causing some seismic disturbances. Huh. That's a cool excuse. Yeah. Yeah. And just like another place said, well, you know, they shut down one, uh, satellite observatory slash underground facility. And so since it's been shut down, the government's not in the area. Hmm. And then here it is like not even, what, eight months later, we're talking to a dude who's like, that's because the government's been annexing all this acreage and even tried to annex some of his acreage of his land. Like the government was trying to claim it. Hmm. And he's like, I already own that land. You can't come get like, oh. And so they were basically, there was a border and they've just been steadily expanding how much, you know, land and making it all. Uh, you know, uh, not public access anymore. The higher magnitude ones of these are all concentrated in one area, though. That's probably because that was the toughest place to drill. Yeah. Um, hmm. Just outside Columbia, South Carolina. Yeah, that's kind of weird. So anyway, uh, just thought I'd kind of bring that up. And see, we've said in the past that with some of these earthquakes and stuff, that it's just more than likely not a natural thing. I mean, who knows? We don't know. But I tell you what I do know, what? when you start seeing things like, okay, so these underground facilities that were deactivated or what they call decommissioned have been reactivated and recommissioned, including more money to do different things. Why do they keep, I mean, I, I think if you put enough of a paper trail together, you'd find that there's something going on. Now, what we should eventually do research on, because this was a thing for a while there, right after some of this seismic activity, um, lights in the sky reports. We should probably yep. take a look at those soon. And you know what else You t- typically will show up? What? A hum. Oh, a lot yeah. of times there's a nighttime hum, which is why I put this article in the podcast as well. A ghostly <laughs> nighttime hum is invading random towns, and scientists don't know what it is. Really? Yeah. 
Uh, what makes this one unique is that it's actually not in the U.S. It's not in the U.K. I don't know if it's part of the U.K. or not. It's in Ireland. Yeah. Is Ireland part of the U.K., United Kingdom? I don't know. They probably don't want to be called. I, don't, I have no idea uh, how that works. It, it's, it's some politicking going on. Uh, so a mysterious low-frequency noise has settled over the small town of Omag in Northern Ireland, and it's keeping people awake. Hmm. We have a have had multiple instances of weird hums and stuff. And the most famous one I think in the U S is the Taos hum. Yep. So, and allegedly one of the things that can create the Taos hum is a nuclear boring machine (laughs) uses, uses nuclear energy to basically make the tunnel. Like as it burns through it, it makes the tunnel walls. Yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. They don't use no old school boring machine with little rotating jaws like a giant, you know, what earthworm cruising through it. No, it just melts it, it makes nice, nice tunnels. Hmm. Yeah. Because we've all heard it, right? There's, you know, deep underground military bases, and there's tunnels that go from the East Coast to the West Coast, and a submarine was seen off the East Coast, and then two days later was on the West Coast, and how did it get there? And all that other crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But no, like they're calling it the hum. And it's uh, basically reports of the phenomenon have been popping up all over the world for decades, right? So whenever you hear a, a weird hum, they just call it the hum in general. Yeah. And despite numerous experiences with the noise, no one knows exactly what causes it. And it comes in the night, and it settles over the whole towns and keeps people awake for hours on end. Hmm. Typically, it's low-level, omnipresent, and constant, and it's been uh, doing its disturbing work for decades. And see... <laughs> That's where, like, all these other sites try to explain things away. Anything from Harvard tried to do a study in, oh, wow, in 2000 or 2022 and claim that it's pulsatile tinnitus, which is more common at night. And when you're trying to rest, this particular type of tinnitus will act up and, um, Ex- when there's fewer external sounds to mask the tinnitus, it'll keep you awake at night. Uh, they also go to say that it's um, common for specific demographics of people to get it. So if you're all Irish people in an I- Irish village, then you probably have some shared genetics, and that's why you all have it. You know, Again, this is one of those things yeah. where you have a scientist from somewhere who's not personally experiencing it saying, well, you guys are so dumb, you can't even recognize that you have ringing in the ears caused by tinnitus. But then, you know, there's other uh, groups like The Guardian who did some reporting on hearing the hum and saying that allegedly roughly 4% of the world's population is affected by the hum, uh, which is the reported little understood global phenomenon. Uh, now, the Taos hum, which was probably the most concentrated report of it in the United States, had everything from headaches, dizziness, nosebleed, um, emotional health issues, stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, for this tiny village in Ireland, I mean, if it's keeping most of them awake, that will eventually cause emotional concerns. Yeah, all you got to do is go up and ask any kid who's maybe 18 years old, do you hear it? And if they hear it, then it's not tinnitus or what they say it is. Yeah. I mean, it's true because they still have the ability to hear more frequencies than older people. When you get older, your, your hearing shifts. This is how it is. I mean, some high pitch frequency frequency you won't even hear. Right. That actually happened to me this week. Oh, it happened to me with my dad. (laughs) My dad was in the military and he's got severe, a pretty substantial hearing loss from being in the military. Yeah. When you send him a Facebook message, that little ping, you know, loud, annoying ping, can't hear it at all. Well. Like, at all. So. Because you physically lose yeah. that capability. And, you know, uh, once you hit about mid-30s, usually 40s, you stop being able to hear some of these higher pitches naturally. And then as you get older and other things happen, you're less likely to hear stuff. But today, or not today, um, this week I was in a conference with some other people I was one of the younger persons in the room and this particular conference room was in a hotel that was doing their annual alarm testing. Their fire and um, fire extinguishing systems, because they were actually separate, the one that, you know, releases the, the water. Well, it depends on the system, but yeah. It's Bluetooth activated and has a sub-silent alarm 
And I was the only person in the room who could hear it. Yeah. Well, you'll get yours. There'll be a time when there'll be a youngster sitting next to you and you'll be looking in the cabinet and pull out a little flashlight so that you can see it. And the person that's sitting next to you be young enough to go, you can't see that, man. It's right there. (laughs) I know. I don't need no flashlight. But it was like unnerving because I'm like, nobody else, everybody in this is just going on with this other person's presentation and I am crawling out of my skin. Yep. That's what happens. So. Must be nice to be young. I'm not. (laughs) It's a compliment. (laughs) Barely. As I was looking under the TV cabinet with a little flashlight trying to see the back of it, I'm like, man, this sucks. <laughs> it's like, I can't even see it. I look in there and it's like, I could see maybe two feet in. It's yeah. just dark. When I was younger, I could probably, you know, I could see the future. Not anymore, boy. <laughs> so it's like, I got a bunch of flashlights and gave one away as a gift and it was appreciated. I can use that. And it's like, yeah. And I was sitting there thinking that was funny, right? I'm like, that's cool. He appreciates it. Yeah. And I'm like, today looking for a flash. We have like, Seriously, 21 flashlights. <laughs> because it's it's so it's convenient. You shine a light on something, it makes it a whole lot easier to see. That's that's why my best friend gave me that neck flashlight thing last year for Christmas so I could put it around my neck while I do crafts. Yeah, but that's the idea of driving down the road or something where you don't want to have a light on or whatever. <laughs> that's just a nerd gift that she tried and didn't no, work it, out for her. Because it focuses really close. Yeah, so, so you can you know. see. What you need now is a little fan so you can basically focus on what you're doing and have the fan blow you know, all at the same time. Our friend Alicia has those four conventions and swears by it. What, the neck fan? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're pretty cool. So, I had one I wore at a convention one time. Yeah. People were looking at it like it's some kind of Beats headphones or something. Like that. <laughs> My hair is whizzing around like this is nice. <laughs> so your head's nice and cool, but you're basically sweating through your own skin. And you know what? I can't wear those because of the hum. The hum starts to bug me. Well, give it time and it won't. <laughs> so anyway, moving back into the podcast as we're fixing to wrap it up. Um, well, that's it. I think we're that's all we got, right? I don't I. Yeah, I mean... Wait, this, did I miss one? Well, did we actually f- explain away this mysterious hum in Ireland? No, because no, science it says it right here in the title. Yeah. Scientists don't know what it is oh. or what it means. Well, there is one thing in here, and it says, despite the ease with which something like this can be described as a supernatural phenomenon, officials want to make it clear that it is most likely anything but. When asked if the hum could be evidence of a UFO... According to RTE, Donnelly said not to buy into conspiracy theories. Yeah, but I mean, who says that? I'm hearing a hum, it's UFOs. No, it, it, everybody that has been gifted with cable television has watched any of these shows know that the hum is not associated with UFO stuff necessarily. It's about the deep underground military bases and the race of reptilians and stuff <laughs> that all live there. Right? What's Let's go on down to dimming. Right? And fight some aliens down there. Dulce. Or Dulce. Yes. Deming. What's, what's in Deming? Rock people. Okay. Either way. And ghosts. A and, lot of ghosts. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. You know, like, oh, there's UFOs causing a hum. Maybe not. But it's more than likely reptilians and all that stuff going on. <laughs> what's really probably more than likely is just all the governments have got together and they're basically building all these deep underground, you know, bases and buildings and cities and stuff so that the next time that the population gets wiped out because of an asteroid or whatever, uh, humans can survive. And before people smirk and laugh at that, there's a whole underground city in Turkey they didn't even know existed until somebody popped a hatch on one of those things. So, wow, an entire city could live here. Yeah. And then they found one in China. Huh. And there's allegedly some that are in the Grand Canyon that go into an underground city where a city of people could live. Yeah. It's almost like humans have been through this before where the surface gets wiped out, but it's okay because you can live underground well, because they that, knew it was coming. That whole Carlsbad Caverns network that allegedly runs almost to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And then there's reports that if it weren't for certain types of shifts that happen, plus the Mississippi River, Mammoth Cave at one point could have connected to you know, some of the caves towards the mid- the Midwest and the, the West. Yeah. I mean, it, they have been yeah. talking for a minute about, oh, watch out, because the poles are going to shift, the magnetic and true north, and it's, it's all going to shift, and it's going to cause all these terrible things happen. What better place to be than be underground? Make it safe. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's ongoing efforts to preserve the human race by building underground cities. They just got to ride it out for about, I don't know, however long. 
seven years or something crazy like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, would you be shocked? No. Yeah, exactly. And we've made enough movies about it. Movies that seem to be pretty well thought out. Like, that's why we have social security numbers to determine who gets to go inside and who gets to stay outside. <laughs> I mean, what if it is? What if the social security is, is just a lottery? That's, don't make me think that. It was the premise of an entire movie. I think it's the one where uh, President Morgan Freeman said something. Mm. And it goes in threes. They always make three movies about the same thing. I'm sitting here. You know what that is? That's just to kind of give you a heads up. I mean, 2012, I'm sure there was a lot of people rocking around 2012, but we all know 2012 is not 2012. (laughs) Right? Because the Gregorian calendar is wrong. So maybe they're getting, maybe they're fixing to get ready for it. Okay. I'm just sitting here like, do we use this earthquake map to figure out where the uh, underground city is? What makes you think we're going to be allowed in? Like, excuse me. professional podcasting (laughs) skills. (laughs) I think that's a little bit of a stretch, right? I don't know about all that. Like, excuse me, we're taxpayers. <laughs> you know, it's like, you think them dudes care at all? I like how people are like, I'm a taxpayer and I have a right to know exactly what's going on in this military installation. You can put the camera away and you can get off the base and we're going to make you leave. Mm. And then people are genuinely shocked. <laughs> you're like, am I being detained? No, you're being arrested <laughs> by the federal government. You're going to go to jail for a long time, right? Yeah. Like, how dare you not let me on? It's like, dude. And, you know, the military dudes are trained. They'll put a, a, cause I mean, they don't know. Mm. They're trying to protect the stuff that can explode more than you can explode. Or from people. Mm. You come running up and try to take over base. It's, uh, it's not good for you. That sort of thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So anyway, uh, we do appreciate you taking time to listen to the podcast. This has been season seven, episode two nine six of the Creep Peaks podcast. Uh, we talked about some weird stuff: weird moon, weird earthquake, and hum haunted object disposal. We didn't talk about that. No, we didn't. All right. <laughs> okay. So moving back into the podcast, I knew there was something I was forgetting. Did I just skip over it? I could, or did I not even put it in here? I think you didn't even put it in here. Honestly. That is ridiculous. Yeah. That so. is ridiculous. I didn't put it in here. So let's let me see if I can find it and put it in the podcast. I thought I had it in there. Well, what brought well did the video I shared about the person who brought stuff home from the thrift shop bring this up? Well that and we still have keys and stuff. I was just thinking about it. Yeah. And then I seen the article and oh yeah. Hmm. What did I do with it? Well, that's just silly. We probably should have just pretended like we covered it. Nobody was paying attention because now I can't find it. Uh, how to get rid of your haunted object. Let me find this. It's from I had your favorite spe- website, Higgy Pop. It is not my favorite website. <laughs> Let me go ahead and throw this. It's in a the site that notes. seems to actually be more active with all of this stuff and is making a real go at it compared okay. to other stuff that we see. There we go. Haunted object disposal. <laughs> there we go. So, this Hickey Pop article. <laughs> Don't, this is serious. Don't laugh at it. It does open up with, are you being tormented by a spirit or negative energy attached to an item? Have you wondered how to best dispose of the object? Uh, perhaps burn it, bin it, or bury it. Uh, that means throw it in the trash. Yeah. So, cursed or haunted items can take many forms, from the common haunted doll phenomenon to cursed paintings antiques, family heirlooms, and pretty much anything else. In my experience growing up, because part of my family are junk and antique dealers, we did run across quite a few bits of haunted jewelry to the point where if we were buying antique jewelry, we would avoid opals, honestly. That was just a thing. Uh, Opals and rubies, but we really, you know, if it was a good enough ruby, we'd go ahead and get it. Um, And that's just because... When a person wears something for so long, uh, in some people's train of thought, their essence, their personality, a piece of their soul is with that item. And if that person was a good person or a not good person, part of that vibe, part of that energy transfers to that piece. Yeah, or tragedy. Yeah. It's kind of like stone tape, stone tape theory, but you're wearing it. And tragedy, you know, if it was a tragedy like 
all these haunted dolls, unfortunately, not every doll is owned by a child who survives things. So, you know, if a child passed away traumatically or through illness, some of that energy is transferred to these what some people call adorable or beautiful dolls. I find most dolls creepy. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and then paintings, the amount of energy an artist puts into creating a painting, there's got to be some energy in that. Um, and then, you know, like we said, the longer you have an item, the more likely it is to carry some residual stone tape energy type stuff. Yeah. Um, if you feel like you, you're having a, ne- you know, an item's having a negative impact on your life, you should really honestly remove it from your life as quickly and cleanly as possible. Uh, we've done some episodes where somebody f- got an object from a thrift shop. The most recent one, I think, was the leather jacket some dude got from a New Mexico thrift store, and it, like, terrorized him for a while there. Uh, the best thing to do, though, where I may disagree with this is to really analyze and pinpoint the item. Cause is it the item? Is it something on the item? Is it something else you weren't even thinking of? Well, you know what I say? What? When in doubt, throw, throw it, out. it out and see that's that the works for refrigerator too. These people say, you know, Leftovers. just place the object outdoors or in a shed or a garage or a sealed room until you have time to deal with it properly or to isolate it to verify that's the item causing you problems. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, because like, you know, when Greg and I go to a thrift shop, we might pick up a funny painting, a whole bunch of books, and some weird knickknack. Was it the weird knickknack or was it one of the 10 books I bought that day, yeah. you know? So move just moving the item to a location where it doesn't have access to you or your family's energy may help quiet the item or may help you determine... Okay, that's the item causing us trouble. Yeah. Um, now, which is funny, which means that you're paying attention to it. And, of course, when you pay attention to it and you put the intent towards it, then it can actually increase activity if there is activity there. Or and it can also increase you thinking that there's yeah. activity. Now, part of that, though, speaks to this next option. It's kind of feed if, it. If you're feeding it, you know, indirectly feeding it or acknowledging its power – then using something like a sealed or locked box can help reduce the item's negative power. Because if you are intentionally putting that intention, I am putting you in the sealed box away from me. Even though you've been feeding it like, oh my gosh, I'm pretty sure this is a haunted doll. Oh no, this haunted doll is going to ruin my life. I have the sealed box. The sealed box will help keep me safe from haunted doll energy. Yes. You know? Intent is a powerful thing yeah. if the act of sealing an entity is done with yeah. confidence and conviction. So you got to be in it to win it. Yeah. You got to believe what you're saying. You got to put the, put, you got to put your ass into it. Yeah. This next recommendation, this is one that Greg and I are currently still dealing with. We have a haunted batch of items in our house And they are so intrusive and bad luck in our lives that touching them causes problems. We have the haunted keys still because even if I put on a pair of gloves and try to put them in a box and go send them to one of our two friends who have haunted museums, I'm not prepared to have a bad week. Yeah. (laughs) You know? So, yeah, it's a thing. So, yeah, we don't want to touch them, you know? And even though they're wrapped in salt and I've sealed the container that they're in, uh, an antique container with wax and with burlap, I've sealed the container. Just touching the container that these keys are in gives me a very bad day that stretches into days. Yeah. If you don't mind destroying it with fire, that's probably the best way is to burn it if you can. Right. And, and this would, method works for objects which are flammable. Most keys and stuff are not flammable. So you should avoid burning plastic and other materials that release potentially toxic fumes when burnt. So if you're going to do something like that, you kind of want to do it outside. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. Because and you want to do a purification ritual with fire. Depending on your traditional beliefs, it's actually bad to burn it in your own hearth. Yeah. So burn it outside. Yeah. Make sure you have proper burn permits. <laughs> yeah, and most of us these days yeah. don't actually use the fireplace as a hearth, so you could probably get away with burning it in there. But if you're gonna go, if you're gonna go through all this effort, you might as well do it outside in a way. Yeah. Um, time to make a little fire pit, do something. So the best way to burn an object is to first light a fire, either outdoors, right, or yeah. where we're gonna do it to be safe. 
Once the fire is burning well, then you throw the object in it and you let it burn. And here's the important part. Don't extinguish the fire yourself. It needs to naturally go out. Yeah. So, uh, and then when that's done, you want to allow the ashes to cool and then you pour salt in the ashes and it's basically supposed to be a purifying substance salt and it'll ensure the unwanted energy is completely left the remains of the object. And then you mix the salt and ashes together and you place them in a container and you want to bury them. And it doesn't say bury under a full moon. It just says bury. And see, that's also where I vary because depending on what it is, my beliefs take me to once you've mixed them with ash and dirt and salt, all those together, put them in running water. Yeah. So it depends that. on what it is. So depends on where you're at too. Yeah. You can disperse them in the air. The wind scatters the wind. The wind scatters them too. So there's different ways yeah. to take care of it. So uh, it's whatever you feel uh, gives the most bang for your buck intentionally with your intention. Because remember, you're putting your putting your effort into it and <laughs> believe in what you do. And, uh, and there's another way you can get rid of it. Yeah. Just abandon it. Just like a dog going to the farm. <laughs> Just set it out somewhere and walk away. <laughs> I, I see. I have a big problem with this art. This paragraph. Yeah, that way you says, know. Hey, when you're walking down the road, and you're like, "Ooh, check out this weird bottle," or yeah. "Check out this weird box." It's abandon or bury it at a crossroad. This yeah. is also a good place to bury the ashes if you've decided to burn them, because crossroads are sites where paths cross, and over time, many people's energies cross here. You're basically impugning the other people's energies. Oh, that's called rejuvenation. Like without their, like these people are unknowingly crossing paths with something you're attempting to disseminate. Maybe the idea is that enough people cross those paths that it just sort of gets dissipated, that little pieces of the intent of the object goes with whatever's there. So enough sort of dilutes it. And see, this is, you know, granted this, this does harken back to, you know, old hoodoo traditions but in some instances, I don't think it's a great idea unless it's, you know, an act of hoodoo, like spellcraft. Yeah. So, yeah. well, uh, you know, and granted, this is from the UK, but it says in the UK, there's a tradition of burying, burying criminals at crossroads. Those who cannot be buried uh, in consecrated ground. So I guess that's the next best thing. <laughs> so if you can't bury it, then ideally you want to bury it away from your house maybe in a remote location where it won't affect other people. And you dig a hole as deep as you can, you place the object or ashes in the hole, pour salt over it and then bury it. Now, if you're going to do a supernatural style, you dig a big hole, you dump the ashes in, you put lighter fluid and pour some salt and set the whole thing on fire again. Yeah. Yeah. And then you jump in your big black Impala and drive away, listen to Kansas. <laughs> right. And then yeah. oh, copyright. Another, you better be careful or they're going to get a subpoena. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, they also, you know, towards the end of this article, they mentioned the, the bo- living body of water or, um, you know, being mindful of consecrated ground and the environmental impact of what you're doing. That's They only just mentioned that yeah. towards the end. And this is one that I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Because it reminds me of what you don't do with a car battery. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. Uh, you take and place the object on a large stone and leave it for several days in an out of the way location, and the natural substance will absorb the negative energy. Yeah. If you take a car battery and you put it on concrete and it's cold and you let it sit for a couple of days, it'll kill your battery just because it's cold and it yeah. sucks the energy. So maybe so, that's maybe that's where that comes from. Maybe that's a new and that's a new a new method. Yeah, that's their method of trying to cleanse the item. Yeah. So uh, the other methods would be like traditional cleansing according to, you know, folklore and witchcraft beliefs or, you know, even simple holy water type traditions. So I would refer to those traditions if you really truly wanted to cleanse your haunted object. Yeah. And to sort of wrap it up a little bit with this, a good other option would be to pass it on to a paranormal investigator or team who will know how to (laughs) safely handle and dispose of it for you. Which... I have cautioned people against many times because two weeks later, you see the haunted item on eBay. Yeah. Or uh, they try to give it back to you. Or that professional paranormal team maybe is not quite as professional in the, in, in the skills. Yeah. I mean, they all got the t-shirts. Extreme, right? <laughs> so, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Might I, want to be. Well, if anything, though, if you pass it on to them, you're, you're passing on the problem to somebody else, so. 
what do you have to say? What is it, blackjack, no take back, or whatever, something like know. that? Some kind of school thing? No backsies. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> I I don't know. I, or you might find up in a museum. You should hold out if it's really haunted. Maybe someone will buy it from you. I mean, we'll be donating ours if we ever get around to it. No, um, they're going to get buried. Mm. Deep in the ground. Anyways. Um, as soon as uh, a, a tractor. As soon as we... It's a tractor. We ain't burying them here. <laughs> so, well, we might just have to bury them in somebody's mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Welcome. Oh, got a little. You may have already won. <laughs> Don't you dare. <laughs> there you go. Right. All right. Anyway, there you go. So there's a, a a way to take care of some haunted object type stuff. There's many different methods you can employ. You you definitely want to employ the one that you feel most confident in, and you have the intent or the idea, the confidence that it's actually going to work. Because if you go about it, ha- if you go about it, and you don't have a full conviction behind it, then it's probably not going to work. Or if it does work, it won't be for long. I don't, and see, my my biggest thing is sometimes these cleansing suggestions don't always work, and at that point, I would recommend getting some help. Yeah, you got to do a multifaceted attack. You got to really kind of layer it up. Yeah, not just one shot and done. Yeah. So. Anyway, there you go. So now we're going to go ahead and wrap up the podcast. You've been listening to the Creepy Peaks Podcast. It's episode uh, two ninety six. Yeah. Season 7. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Like I said in previous episodes, join us on Facebook in our Facebook groups. Um, Creep Geeks Facebook group, real easy to find. Or interact with us on any of the social media platforms. Instagram, TikTok, anywhere. Yes. Yeah. All right, so anyway, there you go. going to go ahead and wrap it up. And so uh, until our next episode, see you later. Take it easy. Bye, sickle. Bye.